But if we look at how we're going to feed people, there's a real problem. The first 20 years of the Green Revolution had a fairly linear, straight-line increase in global yields. But that has been leveling off. It's not leveled off, but it's slowing. If you will, there's a declining slope. We are still having yields go up around the world, but they're going up less and less every year. And we've hit a point now, as you know, where we've run out of surplus grains around the world, and global food demand for grains is going up about 1.4% a year, whereas the grain yields are going up 0.9%. It may not sound like much, a 0.5% difference, but food, as you know, is an essential quantity for people. We would give every last penny we had to have food to keep us from starving. And we do something comparable to that even when we're not starving, we're just hungry. So this mismatch that we have right now between global demand for food being increased because of more people, but especially because of higher incomes and people wanting to improve their diet, and our investment in yield is a, is a major issue that we have to uh, face. Well, one way we can solve that issue is by using more land. In the Green Revolution, we didn't use very much more land. There wasn't, it was only 10% more land was cleared for agriculture in that 40 years uh, because of the increased yields. Well, let me let you know what the global land base is like. Right now, we use 5 billion hectares of land for agriculture. A billion hectares is a little bit more than the area of the full United States. So it's like five times the, the land mass of the United States, counting Alaska and Hawaii, is used to grow food for six billion people right now on Earth. Luckily, to double global food production, we're not going to need 10 billion hectares. That's the really good news. If yields can keep increasing uh, on the trajectories that we are on right now, we will need, though, 1.7 billion more hectares. That means around the world, we're going to have to take out of existing ecosystems, uh, mainly tropical rainforests and tropical savannas. We have to clear the vegetation, start plowing those fields, and so on. It's going to take about 1.7 billion hectares of land to do that. So that's not quite twice the area of the United States. But there only is 2.7 billion hectares of land in the whole world that is at all suitable for rain-fed agriculture. And so we'll be using up the vast majority of the, of the remaining fertile lands of the world that have enough moisture to be of any use to us. The whole world, I might point out, has 8.5 billion acres of land that humans consider at all worthwhile. You get rid of deserts, tundra, and Antarctica, you're down to 8.5 billion hectares. We use five of it already for agriculture. We'll need 1.7 if we continue on the path that we are on right now. Now, if we do clear 1.7 billion uh, hectares of uh, rainforests and savannas and a few other kinds of lands around the world, clearly there will be some major consequences. Those lands, as you know, are home to the vast majority of species that live on Earth. These are the most diverse lands on Earth. So there clearly will be uh, significant losses of the biological diversity of Earth. Um, also, this vegetation, and some of you, a few of you that were there yesterday when I talked about this in a different context, vegetation contains lots of carbon. There's as much carbon in the vegetation of the earth as there is in all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. When we clear those lands, the carbon that's in that vegetation becomes carbon dioxide in the air, a greenhouse gas. And when we farm soils, soils contain twice as much carbon as does the, all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And when we farm soils, 30 to 50 percent of the carbon in the soil is released by mi microbes. Microbes basically consume the organic matter in the soil. When they do that, they release nutrients, which we use for fertility. They also release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And we lose 30 to 50 percent of the carbon in the soil to the uh, atmosphere during the first 50 years of agriculture, at which point the, cells, you, the soil reaches a new equilibrium with its, with its crop and its management practices. And if we get rid of these uh, large, vast expanses of rainforests and savannas around the world, we also lose all the other services that these ecosystems provide to the people in their vicinities, clean water and so on. So that is a, an issue that I think is a, is a very major issue for us to confront. Um, here. So let me give you some numbers on this. Uh, this would be clearing about 60%, as I said, of the remaining rain-fed lands uh, to this 1.7 billion hectares of land. Um, if you look at the amount of carbon stored in the trees, if you look at a tree and we're, let's say, cut down a tree, all the things is above ground in a tree, dry it out and weigh it, half of the weight is the element carbon. Life is carbon-based. This is about true if they do the same, same thing to us, but please don't cut me down and dry me. Uh, so half of that is carbon. That carbon is going to be released. 
And if you multiply out the amount of carbon in different kinds of ecosystems and some projections about how much of them might be cleared for this 1.7 billion hectares of new agricultural land, it would amount to releasing about five gigatons of carbon per year, every year for the next 50 years. Now, how much is five gigatons of carbon? We currently, in combusting fossil fuels, release just a little bit under eight gigatons of carbon. So this is, what is five-eighths is a, in any other way? It's a big number. It's, a, it's an awful lot of carbon that we'd be releasing uh, that, uh, this five gigatons, that frankly, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is, not, is assuming we will not release. They make incredibly optimistic assumptions about how we're going to grow food and not have to clear any more land, about how yields will increase and so on. I think a much more honest uh, uh, assumption, if we go on with business as usual, is that we are going to be releasing something on the order of at least three and maybe up as much as, as five gigatons of carbon per year to the atmosphere, a major greenhouse gas impact, what, 60 or so percent of the greenhouse gas impacts we have from our current biofuels.